Welcome to the Kerrville Bible Church Pastors Podcast, where we seek to encourage and equip you in your walk with Christ by exploring a variety of biblical and theological topics. Stay tuned to the end of the episode to learn how you can submit a question for us to answer on the podcast. Welcome back to the Kerrville Bible Church Pastors Podcast. My name is Toby Baxley, and I'm joined as always by Scott Christensen, Chris McKnight, and Murray Van Gundy. And uh, I'm tired today, brothers, after that <laughs> concert last night. Did it was, it was uh, wonderful. We had, for those of you who don't know, we had the Masters University Chorale in concert here at Kerrville Bible Church last night, and it was wonderful. It was worshipful. And we're very thankful, but uh, it was late. <laughs> uh, but after the concert was over and getting everybody, uh, all the students paired up with their hosts, and then we got we hosted two at our house, and we visited with them till way past our bedtime, um, and then had them up early this morning to get them back here by nine. So uh, uh, anyway, I'm. I'm dragging today, but uh, it was it was good. Um, hey, we're going to talk about a, a, a bit of a continuation of what we talked about last uh, last week. Um, we're going to look at uh, the differences of of belief between Christianity and the cults. So um, uh, I'm going to let Scott. This is his this is his topic, and so uh, he's got some stuff to share with us. Scott, sure. Well, you know, this is a this is a large topic. We we talked about it last week, and there's a lot of different directions you can go with this topic. You know, you could talk talk about the relationship between Christianity and just all world religions, but I, I feel like we need to narrow that topic and and look at what distinguishes the Christian faith from pretenders, I guess you could say, to the Christian faith, which would obviously include the cults, namely I'm thinking of Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses. They are the two most popular and and common cults uh, that we encounter um, in in the world, in America in particular. Uh, But you might include other pretenders, I would say, to true Christianity, to biblical, faithful Christianity. And I think you do have to put in that category Roman Catholicism, Although there's a lot of commonalities in belief between Roman Catholics and, and Protestants, and when I say Protestants, I'm thinking of Protestants in the true Reformation uh, mold of what they saw Protestantism uh, uh, looking like. And so, you know, when you think of Protestantism, you've got some very liberal people that call themselves Protestants. But I would put them in that category, too, of being pretenders mm. to a true Christian faith. And so, you know, what are what is the sine qua non? You know, what is the uniqueness of true biblical Christianity that would separate true biblical Christianity from these pretenders, these these cults, these... Christian in name, but not right. in true substance. Can you define sine qua non for Murray? <laughs> he just said uniqueness. I heard it. <laughs> okay. Uniqueness. But how about define, because I think some people might get confused with when we say world religions and then we say cults. Yeah. So can you give a definition of a cult? Yeah, I think a cult, and, and yeah, a cult can have a wide definition as well, because you could have a cult that does not pretend to be Christian. Um, Trying to think of an example of that. But, and and a lot of times people have this view of cults of like these really wacky type people, you know, the David Koresh's of the world that did claim to have some kind of Christian, you know, whatever beliefs, but were clearly you know, way outside that pale. Mm-hmm. And and typically when you think of those kinds of guys, you know, you, you have these small groups of people that are that are connected to a very charismatic leader who is a messiah like figure um that that people cling to and 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 generally he leads these people into destructive types types of behaviors and whatnot, even 
you know, killing themselves yeah. in some cases. Jim Jones. So, yeah, Jim Jones Kool-Aid. types. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I wouldn't place I, – I think we need to be careful that we wouldn't place like Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses in that same category. Correct. Um, you know, when you meet a, a, a typical Mormon – you know, or a Jehovah's Witness, you know, they're not, they're not these unstable, you know, kinds of people who are, you know, a danger to themselves, per se. Right. They haven't identified some human being as a, as a godlike figure in their mm-hmm. life or yeah. a messiah. They don't really have that going on, although Joseph Smith might yeah. get close to that for yeah. Mormons. But he's dead and gone, so it's not like we're yeah. we're literally, you know, following somebody in, under his, his tent and on his compound or right. or whatever. Right. So, yeah, that's a good, yeah, good distinction. Yeah, like so. maybe the, the conservative cult, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. if you will. Uh, I think maybe, a, a sim- maybe too simple, but a simple definition would be taking the truth and twisting it just a little, just enough. Yeah. And how yeah. much does it take? It's just, it's just, it's one twist, right? It, it, it could right. be a big twist, but even if it's just one little twist off of what is the, right. what we would call true biblical Christianity and, right. and, and, um, everything that entails, it's taking it, just twisting it just, just off yeah. enough makes it a cult. Yeah. And I think we should make another distinction as well. Like, like typically Protestants don't refer to Roman Catholicism as a cult. Right, right, and, and I think that's because there are far more commonalities between Roman Catholics and Protestants than there are between, you know, even broadly speaking, Roman Catholics and Protestants versus the cults, right. and and right. so I think that's why you need to really dig down deeper into what really distinguishes biblical Christianity, even from Roman Catholicism. So, for example, I, I, I think one of the key areas where you need to make that distinction and, and per, perhaps an area I'd like to focus on in our podcast is who is Jesus Christ? Um, you, know, you know, Jesus says, who do people say that I am? Ask the disciples this, and, it, and it's an essential question that everyone that claims to be a Christian has to ask, who is Jesus Christ? And, um, and so I think where... Roman Catholics and Protestants would would be together is in their understanding of the person of Christ. Uh, most Roman Catholics and Protestants would be in full agreement, you know, that Jesus is uh, a the third, you know, the second person of the triune God. Uh, we both agree in the doctrine of the Trinity. We both agree that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Uh, there would be no difference there. Where we would find differences with Roman Catholicism would be on the work of Christ. And and so uh, those, you know, pretenders to the true Christian faith are always going to have a distorted or diminished view, I believe, of either the person of Christ and or the work of Christ. Yeah, because we could say the Roman Catholics... It's the same Jesus, but it's a different salvation, different work, right? Where, yes. Where we would say mm-hmm. Jehovah's Witness, it's an altogether different Jesus. Yes. Right. You're talking you know, about, you know, complete, with the cults, you're yeah. talking about an altogether different Jesus. Yeah, the person of Christ. Yes. But the work of Christ in Roman Catholicism is different than biblical Christianity. Yeah. Right. So and here, bi- oh, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. just to clarify, so in biblical Christianity, or, or with, a, with a cult... You have not only a wrong view of the person of Christ, but you also have a wrong view of his work. Mm -hmm. In Roman Catholicism, they have a right view of the person of Christ, but they have a wrong view of his work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think where because this where this is so important is uh, you know going back to something that uh, John MacArthur said. There's basically two religions, right? There's a religion of of God's accomplishment. And then there's a religion of man's accomplishment. Yes. And if you get the work of Christ wrong, then you're left with the religion of man's accomplishment. Um, and so, you know, if if what Jesus did on the cross was not sufficient, if it was merely, I don't know, helpful, then we're left we're left to do salvation for ourselves. That's right. right. That's right. Even if it's just one percent. Yeah, right. And and that would be the common denominator between every pretender to the true gospel. So that would include Roman Catholics and the cults. 
because, you know, essentially when you boil down their view of salvation, and that's what we're talking about, um, it ends up being a works-based salvation where Christianity is a grace-based monergistic, and what I mean by that, a work, a single work of God to accomplish the work of redemption on behalf of sinners. And so it's it's you know, it's faith based because it's grace based because it's Christ centered in the fullness of it. Yeah, when it comes and, to the RCC, yeah. yeah, the five solas of the Reformation. Exactly. Right. That's good. I agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on, JC's <laughs> I don't have anything to add. I uh, I remember maybe fifteen years ago. Um new in the ministry and MacArthur, it was a sermon or something, but or he was at a, at a conference, something. And he said, do we view our Roman Catholic friends or people, 1 billion Catholics in the world, roughly he said, do we view them as brothers and sisters in Christ or as the mission field? And man, he got a lot of slack for that. Do y'all remember that? It was maybe wow. about 15, 18 years ago. I've heard him speak on it many yeah, times. Many times. And, Some form uh, or another. And that's a great question for us, right? That's a great, great question for us in this room and our listeners. Are they the mission field or are they brothers and sisters in Christ? And I think there's, I think it's mixed. Yeah. You know, I think it's mixed, but I would say overall, overarching, they'd be more the mission field than they would be. The brothers. And I've heard him say that thirty percent of their church membership have come from Catholic backgrounds. Yeah, and and what the Catholic background does for you is can, it, it hammers home that you're sinful and wretched. You know that they they do a good job of that. Yeah. They do Catholic <laughs> guilt. total depravity. Yeah, yeah, they do a good job of guilt and shame. Uh, but <laughs> the, sadly, it's not total depravity. No. You know, in their theology, it's a partial depravity. Partial. Uh, but uh, they certainly have a system that makes the average churchgoer there uh, feel guilty and feel shameful. Um, and so, you know, some of that work has been done for us, if you think of them as a mission field, for sure. I mean, what they need to hear about is grace. They need to hear a clarification between justification and sanctification. Mm, right. uh, they need to understand that, uh, you know, their whole system includes grace, but it's, uh, it's grace that's infused uh, you cooperate with it. It starts with your baptismal regeneration and infant baptism, and then you must cooperate with it to maintain your justification throughout your life. And uh, Michael Horton's got a great illustration of this in his uh, book on Calvin that we're doing as a book club. He says the the sacraments in the religious in the Roman Catholic system is like an IV that feeds into your uh, soul to infuse your soul with the grace it needs to maintain your salvation. Mm-hmm. And that's I thought that's a beautiful, a perfect illustration of what they're doing. You know, every yeah. sacrament is I'm hooking myself up to a to an IV to sustain my weakness instead of recognizing from the beginning that I have nothing to contribute. I, yeah. I'm not weak, I'm dead. I'm not um, struggling. I'm I'm dead in my sins and trespasses. I'm totally depraved all that. And so mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you're partially depraved, then you need a partial Savior. Yeah. 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 <laughs> when you're totally depraved and you understand that, you need all of Christ and you need it to be all of Him because you can't contribute anything out of your depravity. And yeah, so, yeah, Christ isn't an IV, right? He's, he's your whole life. I mean, you're, 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 you've been... Heart transplant. You're a, yeah. new, <laughs> yeah. you are a new creation. Yeah. You know? Colossians 3, when Christ who is our life appears. Yeah, uh, yeah. And it's it's a, I've heard I've heard the difference here between really Protestantism, I guess biblical Christianity and and Catholicism is we've got the same words, it's a different dictionary, right? Yeah, we're, right. We, we're we talk yeah. about grace, but our grace is sufficient. Our, the His grace saves, and the the grace as the the Catholics in. in a, understand it is merely helpful i think for and you you're still you're still you're still in this kind of works righteousness yeah it's essential yeah. but it's not sufficient yeah yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and I, I think that's an important point toby because you know the language of roman catholicism jehovah's witnesses mormonism 
really mimics much of the same language that we use. And it's easy for oh, people right. who don't dig deep into asking the question, well, what do you really what are you mean really saying, you know, yeah. by you these mean? things? You, you know, you're just, oh, well, look, they, they affirm the same Jesus we do. Yeah. And, uh, right. you know, there's a lot of, for example, there's, there's a huge controversy over the chosen um, you know, this is a popular TV show, and I'm sure a lot of our audience is watching that show, and and I have deep concerns about that show. Uh, but what is interesting is that Mormons have really latched on to that show. I've, I've read a lot of mm. articles in the, in the Desiree News Service, which is a strictly Mormon news organization, and the Mormons have completely embraced that show. Uh, it's it, the carrier of the show is this angel something I forget the name of it right. uh, that's owned by a Mormon company. Then now the, the makers of of the show, um, you know, are not Mormon. Dallas Jenkins, who's the creator of of this show, you know, it claims to be an evangelical Christian, and I have no doubt that he, you know, his claim to that, but. Um, but he has purposely created a show that kind of softens the edges. Yes, yeah, more of who universal. Is. Yeah, yeah, more, so more that, universal. Yeah. So it's as appealing to a wide of yeah. uh, as an audience uh, as possible, and um, you know, and, and he talks about it. He says that 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 when I've talked to my brothers and sisters in Christ, and when I talk about those LDS folks who know that I love the same, who love the same Jesus that mm-hmm. I do. Yikes. Yeah. Right, I'm referring to some of the friends uh, that I have who identify as LDS and who have gotten to know very deeply, who I've gotten to know very deeply over the last few years. So there's been a lot of controversy over over the show uh, because of that, and, and I think that he has purposely created an appealing vision of who Jesus is. You know, obviously borrowing from the Gospels, but. But casting this vision of Jesus in a way that's as appealing to as many people as possible. And I think that's problematic yeah. because it's very easy to, uh, you know, to, you know, have the same language and, right. oh, well, it's, it's a show about Jesus, so surely right. it has to be Christian. So right. it begs the question, what do, because I think in recent times, LDS, well, they even don't even want to be called Mormons, right? They want to be called. Church of the Latter Day yes, Saints, that's right. Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, yeah. right, right, right. So I think there's actually been a movement within those circles to, to that they use they use Jesus. They they say Jesus is Lord. Um, they they might even say that we're Christians. Yeah. Um, and so it begs the question: What do they actually believe about Jesus? Yeah. So, so that's a good point. <laughs> um, first of all, Mormons do not believe that uh, that Jesus is truly God, uh, in, the, in the same way that, that um, you know, that uh, J, JWs believe. There's some very strange views about Jesus. First of all, they believe that he was the spirit child of the union between the Father and the Heavenly Mother, who happens to be Mary. And so there was an actual union between the two, and they gave birth to spirit children that included Jesus and Lucifer. So in the Mormon view, uh, Jesus and Satan are brothers. And and um, the reason why Jesus got promoted and Satan did not is because they, they came, and this is in Mormon theology, they came before the Father and they both presented uh, a plan for redemption. And uh, and. God the Father decided to go with Jesus' plan instead of Satan's plan. <laughs> and Satan's plan was to coerce people to obey God, you know, force them to obey God. And Jesus' plan was, no, we should give every, we should allow everyone to have free will and to make a choice between God or whatever. And God said, I like that plan better than Satan's plan. Yeah. And so that's what we're going to do. It sounds like a bad cartoon. Yeah. Yeah. But what's interesting is, is you know, they will use this language. They'll even say that Jesus' suffering was a, a kind of an atonement, but not a substitutionary atonement. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, Mormons will say that, that Jesus' greatest work was his work in Gethsemane and not on the cross. Mm-hmm. In fact, one Mormon scholar said this. He says, it was in Gethsemane 
on the slopes of the Mount of Olives that Jesus made his perfect atonement by shedding of his blood wow. more so than on the cross. Uh, in other words, the idea of, of Jesus' sweaty work in the garden is like what contributes to our work. And basically the idea is that is that we are called to have some kind of obedience and adherence to mm-hmm. these Mormon, uh, you know, various Mormon doctrines and, and beliefs and practices and whatnot. Yeah. And um, and then Jesus's work in the garden kind of gives us that last push that we need to get up to the top of the hill, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And and so again, it's very man centered. It's very works oriented, and then so grace and faith and all of that is just to give you that extra push that you need to do better, to be the better person. But in their body. system, they've got a Jesus who died on a cross and mm-hmm. was resurrected. Yes, mm-hmm. yeah, yes. that's where wow. it gets very, very <laughs> muddy. Yeah, because it's just a little bit off, right? In their own. On the Church of Jesus Christ dot org in their doctrine and covenants, one of the the works that they they use and right, follow they have three, and teach. They have three, yeah. they have three books, right? Yeah, they, they say Book they Mormon, follow the Bible, Book of Mormon, and that one. Doctrine and, and oh, covenants. Pearl of Great Price, Pearl of, Pearl of Great, Great Price. Price. Yeah. yeah. Where, so is this is this? This a, is a quote from okay, Jehovah's Witness. I mean, yeah. excuse me, from Mormon Mormonism. Church of Jesus Christ dot org. And so, who do Mormons believe Jesus Christ is? Like most Christians, Mormons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Creator of the world. However, Mormons hold the unique belief that God the Father and Jesus Christ are two distinct beings. Mormons believe that God and Jesus Christ are wholly united in their perfect love for us, but that each is a distinct personage personage with his own perfect glorified body. And then Mormons believe... Right, that's right. God the Father has a body. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's it. And Mormons that's believe that all men and women ever to be born, including Jesus Christ, lived with God as his spirit children before this life, which is what you said, Scott. So, Yeah, and the other thing that's important in Mormon theology is that there is no creator-creature distinction. In other words, there's no unique category of godness of which God alone you know, subsists in right. that category, and then a creature category or a finite category. In other words, there's no distinction in being between a lower level human and what you might call higher level God. And, and so God the Father is at the highest level of being, whereas Jesus is slightly lower, you know, than God in being, and we're even lower. lower. And that, so we yeah. can work our way up That's right. to the level of a, a God the Father and become the Father of our own universe. That that's you know, and this is other. where this could be a whole other podcast. But this is where Mormonism and Masonic Lodge start to look a lot, a lot merge alike. A bit. They start to merge because they got all they get these thirty second degree. They got all these mm-hmm. degrees in Mason teaching, and yeah. you make these. I think there's thirty two of them, and you make this progression until you're essentially like it's like this pathway to deification. Yeah, mm-hmm. essentially, and and you kind of have you have some parallels there between that and Mormonism. Um, which shouldn't surprise us because they have the same source, uh, yeah. ultimately. Yeah. So, yeah. so you've got you've got these uh, same words, different meanings of those words, and and a group that desperately wants to be maybe not the old school Mormons where they were you know polygamous and yeah and and outcast and they kind of reveled in their were were persecuted and all of that. It seems to me. My take on it is they desperately want to be recognized, accepted, viewed within as, mainstream Christianity. Within yeah. mainstream yeah. Christianity, yeah. this is a this yeah. is a, a distinct part of the Mormon movement today. Is they th- yeah. they don't want to be cast out as a cult. They don't want to be lumped in with Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm-hmm. They want to be seen as a. Would it be too far to say almost a Christian denomination? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. And I would so, say yeah. they they I I have not studied enough to know. For certain, but I, I recollect this over time. You know, they they go back and they change some of their works to fit what you're saying. They just go back and say, "Well, let's just change this and let's change this." Right? Where we we have one authority, and it's the Word of God, 
that cannot be changed, right? We don't go, well, we want to change because the culture, we want to fit in more, we don't want to fit in, or right. we want to be inclusive or exclusive. We don't change it at all, right? And so they, are ch- they change their own writings and their own teachings that they count as equal to the Holy Bible to fit what you're saying, Chris. Okay, well, yeah. you know, it's a new generation, right? It's a yeah. new generation of, right. of, of people to say, well, I mean, we kind of, we don't want to be lumped in with, the, with that cult over there. We want to be mainstream. And so we're going to change some of our teachings. Yeah. And, that, and that, would, that would be another distinction is w- what is the source of their authority for what they believe? Toby, you made an interesting comment earlier about that, uh, about how they view the Bible. What, did you recall? Well, I sure did make an interesting point that I can't remember <laughs> now. Uh, I think, so when we're talking about the cults, um, we're talking about, it, it goes back to uh, either the uh, their view on inerrancy uh, infallibility and sufficiency yes. of God's word, and when when those are called into question, then we're either going to try to add to it. Mormons add to the Bible, right? Uh, I, I would dare say even that the Catholics would add add teaching to the Bible the uh, because well, the Apocrypha and the and the the, the, teaching the teachings of the the, the yeah. priests and the That's popes, right? right. Um, and then uh, with Jehovah's Witnesses, their their Bible is is altered. So I don't think the the Mormon Bible is altered. I mean, it's still the the Bible, but the the Jehovah's Witness Bible has some distinct differences um, in, in wording yeah. that really changes. It, it calls into question the nature of of Jesus. Yeah, and and there and the the New World Translation, which is a translation of Jehovah's Witnesses, has gone through multiple additions in order to change <laughs> language when it when it's pointed out that certain verses don't fit their doctrine and so they've gone through these addition additions mm-hmm. and you know you can study all that if you want but um, but yeah it's it's a source of authority yeah. and and I think in all of these traditions they end up ultimately undermining the sufficiency the infallibility and errancy and you know, you know, scripture, yeah, right. and uh, and that's where they go wrong. One thing that's different between the two, if we want to talk about JWs and and Mormons for for a moment, I think there are a lot of happy Mormons. I think there are a lot of families that uh, get along pretty well. You know, big families, lots of kids, very family oriented. I, I think a lot of Mormons uh, tend to enjoy their Mormonism. Um, I mean, I, I live right down the street from the local. Mormon church, and there's groups of cars there very, very early on many mornings. I'm not sure what they're doing in there, but that's, you know, be 10, 20, 30 mm-hmm. cars out there at 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, they they seem to, you know, when you meet them at your door, the two young men who, you know, are on their two-year mission, they certainly don't seem like they're carrying the weight of the world on their back, like they're just being crushed by this false gospel. They are. I mean, I'm not saying they're not. They are being crushed by it, but they, you know how they look. You know how they come across. You know, that clean cut. Clean cut. There's just this image, you know, this image. But JW is a different animal altogether. Um, The the underbelly of JWs is there are a lot of suicides that take place within their circles. We had a, we had a family in our church years ago that were saved out of Jehovah's Witnesses. Both the, the man was an elder in the church and the woman was in it and they were in it for years. And uh, what they shared with me is the women, especially in Jehovah's Witnesses, are beat down. They are burdened. They are guilty. They are shamed. They are carrying the weight of the world. Mm. And a lot of the women, there's a lot of suicides within the, especially the females of Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, you're never good enough. You're never doing enough. Um it's just it's just, it's a massive burden. I don't think there's a lot of happiness in Jehovah's Witness in mm-hmm. JWs. I don't I don't think they they have a, a feeling of like like you might find in Mormon families. This particular couple, interestingly enough, she traces her salvation to sitting in a service at Joel Osteen's church, mm. and because all he was talking about was the love of God mm. and grace and God loves you and you know what he talks about yeah. <laughs> you know, she didn't need to hear about sin God used that yeah. in that appropriate time yeah. she'd yeah. been beat down her, you know, for decades o- over her sinfulness and wretchedness and 
And she goes, believe it or not, but I really believe that's when I, I for, for the very first time in my life, felt like Jesus actually loved me and died for me and all of that. And so, you know, they eventually got out of that. They saw through it and they moved to Kerrville and they were part of our church and they were mm-hmm. greatly loved. They loved our church. They grew like crazy. And um, uh, it's, it's just one of the rare, wonderful stories of a rescue of mm-hmm. someone out of, a, out of a cult that just puts its Teeth, teeth yeah. and tentacles into people. Yeah, they won't let them so, go. It's so deceived. Um, Melissa reasoned from the scripture, you know, like last week with a with a Jehovah's Witness uh, lady, uh, and her argument to me was like watertight. You know that mm-hmm. that Jesus is God, and I, I'm looking at it thinking, how could anybody not believe that? But but the, she would say it was just like a, yeah, but this, you know, it was just like, yeah, but I can't deviate from my script, right. you know, and it was heartbreaking. Well, this lady that I'm talking about, her name was Marcia, that uh, was in our church, but she would, would say, if you have those opportunities, especially with the women, it's just show them uh, extreme amounts of kindness, uh, gentleness, mm-hmm. love, uh, show them, uh, talk about grace. Talk about the love of Christ. Uh, talk about forgiveness of sins. Talk about acceptance in Christ. Uh, surety of heaven. I mean, all these things. Yeah. That that's that's what they need to hear more than anything else. Um, and I, I don't. Do, I mean, my tendency is to pound. You know, so, I saw. Yeah. I, so when I said <laughs> shame on you to the people standing in my driveway. That was probably not they were the there, most they, loving thing. <laughs> they, 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 were, they were pretty much used to that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, my, and I, that's the path I go, and it's, not, it's probably not what's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I read a, a book a number of years ago um, <clears throat> on the testimonies of former Roman Catholics who had come to faith in Christ. And I, I think the book had 10 chapters, and, um, and it's a really useful book if you have – Catholic friends that you're witnessing to. But there was a common denominator in in all of these testimonies in in that what brought them to Christ generally was a a, a deeper study of the Bible. And it usually they either were invited to a Bible study or began attending a church where the Bible was taught in an expository manner, in a deep manner, because in the Roman Catholic Church, they don't, they don't really teach the Bible. And there are certain assumptions about what the Bible teaches, but, but there's no real depth. There's no real study. And, and that the common denominator was that, that each of them had studied the Bible, but it took them a long time to begin to sort of deprogram themselves from the teachings of the Catholic Church that conflicted with what the Bible says. And it took some time. It wasn't an immediate thing. And even after they had come to faith in Christ, there was still a a period of sort of pre-deprogramming of their their thinking about, you know, about their their Christian worldview Uh, had to be reoriented around Scripture. And that's just not part of the Roman Catholic you know, mindset. Yeah, well, there, there's this undercurrent that if you leave the Catholic Church, you're leaving the church. You're, you know, and you're going to hell. Mm-hmm. And so you have to, you, you basically, you have to be, <laughs> kind of have to be saved uh, to to leave, you know, uh, because you have to understand that Christ died for you and all your hope is in his substitutionary death. I can be saved outside of and apart from the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, I mean that's what that's really what they got to come to terms with. Yeah, that that I can I can I can be saved apart from the sacraments, apart from a priest, apart from confession, apart from the mass. Yeah, uh, that I don't need any of that to actually be saved. Yeah. and that's <clears throat> I mean that's. I mean that's a ma- that's massive. That's a right. paradigm shift because right. all they've ever known and learned is that salvation requires all of those things working together. Um, and once and, that and truth... even then, you're still not sure. You're still not 100% assured. You still have purgatory on the other side. You still can never have assurance of salvation because it's always a process. Right. Uh, and, and so 
I mean, what what we're really calling them to do is leave behind, and then and then you, all of that theologically, doctrinally, whatever, and then you connect it to mom and dad and grandparents and yeah. and all of the lineage that it usually comes with Roman Catholicism. I mean, I don't know anybody hardly. I mean, it happens, but rarely does somebody convert to Roman Catholicism. Yeah, you know, you're born into it, generally yeah, yeah, speaking, yeah. and you come out of it. You know, some come out, but rarely do people. From the outside, go into yeah. this, yeah. you know. So, uh, yeah, you got so many things to overcome. Uh, it's kind of like what Paul was facing with the Jews in a, in a way in the synagogues and and having to reason with them three Sabbaths. You know, he's like, yeah. okay, this is not a thirty minute conversation. We're done. I mean, this yeah. is over and over and over and over uh, over many sometimes years. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, and it's weird why God works that way, you know. How Luther and Calvin, you know, bam, they come out. But there, there are others who might take may take years to come out. And the fear when they're stuck in that, whatever it might be, whether because of family or whatever, but that fear to let go of that. But once they, once you know, the truth will set you free. Once they are set free, the weight yeah, right. that is lifted off yeah. because of the grace of. God yeah. alone, right? Mm-hmm. In Christ alone, that is so liberating. They, I want, they can't. Be, then, and then it's almost like they can't believe that they were yeah. ever under such weight, mm-hmm. such a works based weight. You and, know. And I think that what you're saying, Chris, about Roman Catholics, I think that's probably true of pretty much anyone who is gripped in a false religion, a false yeah. belief system. Uh, that is so powerful. It's you know, it's true of the cult. It's true of other religions. You mm-hmm. know, Islam, Hinduism, mm-hmm. Buddhism. You know, they are all very all-encompassing. Judaism. You know, <laughs> that, that grip people. You know, and it takes it takes some time to tr- extract your mind, extract your thinking. You know, from those systems that that control every aspect of your life. Yeah. yeah. So it all comes down to who is who is Jesus and what he accomplished, and yeah. uh, person of Christ and work of Christ, That's and right. tied to an inerrant, sufficient, infallible Bible, um, and ultimately then Trinitarian view of God, because yes. all the cults reject that, uh, and uh, grace based salvation, mm-hmm. do versus uh, done. Versus do yeah. Yeah. <laughs> justification by faith alone. Yeah. So get back wow. to the solas and That's all right. of that. So. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Okay. Uh, good stuff. I, I enjoyed it anyway. Uh, Chris, you want to tease our next week? Do you have any? <laughs> no. You no. He's, he's no. barely. It's not ahead. Tuesday yet. It's not next Tuesday yet. So okay. All right. Well, hope you'll join us anyway. Uh, Scott, will you close us in prayer? What I will tease okay. with is. Uh, I mean, there's only there's only three left before our break, right? Right, right. So Toby's going on sabbatical June and July. We're going to take a two month break from podcast, uh, and so we've got we got me, then Murray, then Toby to finish up. So that in and of itself should be a reason why you should listen because right. the so we're, you're about to run out. I mean, so you're you get, yeah. There's just three the left. Could <laughs> happen during a sabbatical. There's just How three. Upset are you going to be like you're going to be like I didn't even get my sabbatical, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Can you come at the end of my rapture? It would be, <laughs> be the ultimate the sabbatical. Ultimate sabbatical. <laughs> the, the ultimate For sabbatical. sure. Yeah. Shalom forever. Yeah. Shalom, shalom. <laughs> All right, Scott, you close us in prayer. Father, we thank you for uh, the truth of your word, the sufficiency and the power of it uh, uh, for salvation to those who believe uh, and, and see uh, the person and the work of Christ for who he truly is and for what he has truly done uh, for those who place their faith in him. Father, as we think about other uh, pretenders to the Christian faith, Father, let us be reminded of the centrality of the triune God and the sending of uh, the unique incarnate Son of God, uh, Jesus Christ, and who he is and what he has done and, uh, and how that has been revealed to us Uh, in your word. Lord, we pray that we would take these things to heart as we uh, bolster our own confidence in the truth of the gospel. And as we interact with those around us 
Father, including those who may be uh, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Roman Catholics, and others, Lord, who, who need to hear the truth of the gospel. Lord, grant us grace and wisdom as we do that, and may you be honored and glorified through it in Christ's name. Thanks for listening to the Kerrville Bible Church Pastors Podcast. We want to be a resource for you and answer the biblical, theological, or pastoral questions that you may have. Send them to us via email at questions at kerrvillebiblechurch.org or leave us a text or voicemail at 830-321-0349. 